In this video, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into programming with Bolt 2, but still very much working with the basics. We're going to be looking at setting up a class, a flow behavior, and adding a couple variables. In the end, this is all going to add up to a spinning hovering cube, which is admittedly a little bit silly, but it serves as a good example of some of the basic Bolt functionality. With that out of the way, let's jump in. I'm starting with an empty scene, but with the Bolt windows already set up. If you missed my earlier video on setting up Bolt, you can check the link in the top right or in the video description below. The first thing we need to do is add a cube to the scene. This can be done from the hierarchy window. Press create and then navigate to 3D object and select the cube. The code that's gonna control the motion of the cube is going to be in a Bolt class. And to attach that to the cube, we need to add a Bolt component to the cube, like so. Next, we need to create the Bolt class. I'm going to do that in a folder that I've called Bolt Classes by right-clicking in the folder, selecting Create, Bolt, and then Bolt Class. The Bolt class needs a name, which in this case I'll call Spinning Cube. We can then drag in the Bolt class into the Bolt component on the cube. Now at this point, no code has been created. All we've done is to create a container for the code and attach it to a game object. To create the code, we need to add a graph to the class. We can do that by right-clicking on the class in the Explorer and selecting Create Graph. In this case, we want a flow behavior. And as another side note, in the next Bolt video, I'll be taking a look at the different types of classes and graphs, so make sure you stay tuned in for that. A flow behavior is very much like a mono behavior and will receive callbacks like start and update, both of which we'll be needing in this video. The first behavior I want to create is a simple spinning action. We can do this by calling a function called rotate on the transform of the cube. This function can be found by right clicking in the graph, selecting add unit, and then searching for transform rotate. Looking at the unit, there are two input parameters. The first is the axis that the cube will rotate on, and the second is the angle or the amount that the cube will rotate. To get a continuously rotating cube, we want this function to be called every frame. And to do that, we need to connect it to an update event. This can be done by dragging down the flow from the update and connecting it to the rotate unit. Now if I push play to test the code, you can see that nothing happens. This is because the axis and the angle are still both set to zero. Leaving it in play mode, I can set the axis to the Y axis by setting the second number to one, and we can also set the angle to one as well. And the result, a slowly rotating cube. You may notice that you can't see the flow of the code in the graph. That's because we aren't looking at the instance of the class on the cube itself. To see that, leave it in play mode and select the cube in the hierarchy. From there, on the Bolt component, click the Open button. You should now see the units light up blue each time they're called, and you should see little circles moving along the flow lines. You can also see the live view by selecting the instance in the Explorer window. If you're new to Bolt, this live view can be super helpful with debugging, especially as things get more complex and you'll actually be able to see the values that are getting passed from one unit to another. We can continue to add code in play mode, but I like to make it a habit to leave play mode to do so. Do notice that when you leave play mode, the changes we made to the rotate unit have stayed. This is both a pro and a con of Bolt. It's just different and it's worth being aware of when you're working with Bolt. Next, let's add our first variable. This variable is going to control the speed or the angle that the cube rotates each frame. In the Explorer, right click on the class and select Create Variable. You can also create graphs, variables, and events from the editor portion of the Explorer or if you have the class selected in the project window, you'll find similar options in the inspector. You may notice that there are limited types of variables if you right click on the class. All the types that we need for this video are there, but if you need another type, then adding your variable through the other two ways will give you more options. It's also important to note that variable types can be changed after a variable is created. For our case, you can choose either an integer or a float variable. It doesn't matter too much, we just need a number. Once the variable has been created, give it a descriptive name. I'll call mine rotation speed. When the variable is selected, options for the variable will be shown in the Explorer. And from there, you can rename the variable, add a summary if you'd like to make notes, 
change the type, and give the variable a default value. You may also notice four toggle options that are new with Bolt 2. The first row has to do with access to the variable. By default, variables start fully public, meaning other code can both read the value and change the value. The second row of toggles is all about the inspector. The first toggle will change whether the variable is shown in the inspector, and the second controls whether the default value in the explorer is used or can be overridden. With the variable created and the inspect toggle set is true, the variable will show up in the inspector. Now by default, it's grayed out, and if you click on the box on the left, you'll be able to edit the value in the inspector. To add the variable to the graph, you can simply drag it onto the graph. This creates a variable get unit. With the unit added to the graph, it can then be connected to the angle node on the transform rotate unit. While this doesn't change the behavior of the cube, it does allow the rotation speed of the cube to be modified in the inspector, and it can be done in real time. This video is a remake of a video from Bolt 1. So I went back and looked at the comments from that video, and one comment said they'd made a fun hovering effect. So let's steal that idea. To make that effect, we need to change the Y position of the cube, and we want it to kind of float or move back and forth. We can do this with the use of a sign function and setting the Y position in the transform. So let's drag down the flow from the transform rotate and search for transform position set. This unit takes in a vector 3. If we just type in values, it will cause the cube to move to that one position, which isn't exactly what we want. We want to be able to change just the Y position, and we want that value to be continuously changing. To do that, we need to create a new vector 3. So right-click on the graph, select Add Unit, and search for New Vector 3. There's a lot of options that will come up, and we want the option that has an X, a Y, and a Z. Next, drag out the Y component of the vector 3 and search for math sign. This brings up our good friend the sign function from high school math. A sign function requires an input value. If that input value grows, then the result of the sign function or the output of the sign function is an alternating value, also known as a sine wave, which is exactly what we want in our Y position of our cube. Now, one easy way to get a constantly growing value is to use time since the level was loaded. So right click and search for time since level loaded and connect it to the input of the sign function like so. If we push play, we can see that the cube is now moving up and down like we wanted. But let's take it a bit further. Let's create a new variable called hover amplitude that will control how much the cube moves vertically. The variable will be of type float. Then with the variable created, we can drag it onto the graph the hover amplitude will multiply the output of the sine function to increase or decrease how much the cube moves. To do that, pull up the fuzzy finder and search for multiply. This brings up several options, and in this case, we want the option with two float values. Once the multiply unit is added, connect its output to the y value of the vector 3, and then connect the outputs of the sine function and the hover amplitude variable to the inputs of the multiply unit. Pushing play, you should now be able to adjust the amplitude of the cube's movement. Now, if by chance your cube didn't start at the origin, you probably notice that it moves when you first push play. This is because the X and Z coordinates are getting set to zero. Or if you tried adding multiple cubes, they're gonna all end up stacked together at the origin. We can fix both these problems by adding the starting position of the cube. To do this, we need to store the starting position as a variable. So let's create a new variable, I'll call mine start position, and it'll be of type vector3. This variable is going to be fully internal to the graph, so I'm going to toggle off, get, and set in the explorer window, but leave inspect on so we can see that the value is being saved. To set the start position, drag the new variable out while holding Alt to create a set variable unit and connect it to the start event, like so. Then drag out the vector3 input and search for transform position get. If we push play and look at the instances in the explorer, we can now see that the start position of the cube is being saved. 
But if the cube started at the origin like mine, the value of the variable won't change as the default value is 0, 0, 0. So to demonstrate this, I can duplicate my cube a couple times, slide them over, and then push play. Looking at the instances in the Explorer, I can now see that each cube has a unique start position. With that done, we need to add a few more units into the update event. First, let's create an add unit. Since we'll be adding two positions together, which are vector 3s, we need to search for add vector 3. The output of the add unit can be connected to the transform position set unit, and the output of the vector 3 unit can be connected to an input of the add unit. The other input is where the start position will be connected. So drag in the start position variable and connect it like so. You should now be able to duplicate the cube and move the duplicates to different positions and they won't jump back to the origin when you push play. You now have yourself a spinning, hovering cube that you can duplicate, move around the scene, and when you push play, they won't jump back to the origin. Creating a spinning, hovering cube is a bit silly and may not help you with your project, but it does show a lot of the basic functionality of Bolt, including start events, update events, and how to use variables with the Bolt 2 workflow. I hope this video was interesting, or better yet, useful for you and your project. If it was, think about hitting that like or subscribe buttons, or if you want to go even further in supporting the channel, you can check out the links to my Patreon or Discord in the description below. So until next time, happy game designing.